Well, good morning, good morning. How, how is everyone today? It's lovely to see you in the house of the Lord. Now, you might think it's strange. We don't have any musicians today. No, it's not a cappella. <laughs> We're going to use some backing tracks today and we hope that you enjoy them. They have actually been composed completely by Jill Jennings on her Clavinova, which is like her best friend. Um, so, as we come into the house this morning, let's just look into the Word of God to start our service today and to bring us into his throne room. And James 4, 5 to 7 in the New Tr Living Translation says, Do you think the scripture has no meaning? They say that God is passionate, that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him and he gives grace generously as the scripture says god opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble so humble yourselves before god resist the devil and he will flee from you and james 4 10 says to us humble yourselves before the lord and he will lift you up Amen. This is God's word. Shall we stand and sing together? Holy is the Lord. Let's lift him up in the service today. This is our God. Let's worship him together. We stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down. the majesty, 
the magnificence of who you are. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. This is a grand song for an amazing God. Let's worship him together. Holy, holy, holy. children to be holy, to walk in holiness and purity before you all the days of our lives. Thank you for your grace that allows us to even be slightly holy. Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit in us enables us, Lord, to walk in holiness and purity before you. Show us more grace, God. Let your grace have its way in our lives. Be seated on the throne of our hearts, God, your rightful place. Take your rightful place as we surrender ourselves afresh to you today.
We are in your throne room, Lord. We are worshipping you at your footstool. Come now in all your fullness and dwell with us where you promise, where two or three are are gathered, there you will be in the midst. And we welcome you, Holy Spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the blessed Trinity, in Jesus' name, amen. Please take a seat. So imitating Christ's humility, we know how important this is, and I just wanted to share these verses in Philippians 2, because they're an encouragement to us, and they teach us God's ways. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, didn't consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that it is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh, that we could just bear some of that resemblance. And I know that we do, and that's exciting. But there's more, so much more in store. Yes, amen. So will you join me, will you join the team as we proclaim Jesus Christ and his mighty power working in this world, working in each of us, working in this church family, and let his presence fall among us and have his way among us. Shall we stand and worship? We proclaim you, Jesus.
God, help us to open our hearts to receive everything that you have for us in this life. Let your grace be poured out upon us, God, as we surrender to you. Because it's your blood, Father God, that cleanses us. It's your blood that gives us life. Lord, in this quiet moment, as we rest in your presence, we call upon your name. And we ask, God, that you would forgive our sin, that you would refresh our hearts, that you would create a clean heart within us. Because your blood was shed for every human being. You are a great and glorious Saviour and Lord, and we worship you and honour your name. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Thank you for your awesome sacrifice. It's your blood that cleanses me. It's your blood that gives me life. It's your blood that took my place. represented banners that have been woven is that a word waved over us <laughs> this morning banners representing God's holiness representing his blood representing his holy fire and his holy anointing and I pray that as these banners have been waved over you with love and with grace that you will experience a fresh awakening from Jesus through the Holy Spirit as he is poured out upon you today. 
may your hearts be refreshed in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, ladies. We're going to um, take up the offering, as I missed that in my schedule. <laughs> and our lovely young men, Tanatswa and Nashe, are going to take up the offering. Please look to the screen um, as we do so. Bless you. Well, good morning. Welcome to you all. Uh, it is good to come and lift up God's name, give him the praise. Sorry, we're getting a bit of echo. That'll be fixed. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nasha and Tantan. Now, a couple of things just to announce. Today is the last Sunday of 10 a.m. church. All right, I have to remind you all of that because since May you've gotten into the habit of 10 o'clock and next Sunday we're going back to 9.30. So I will send out an email, probably on Monday and I'll send another one out on Wednesday, probably another one on Friday, <laughs> just to remind you that next Sunday it's 9.30. Next Sunday also, being a 9.30 service start, we're hoping to relaunch after church morning tea. Yay, some people say. Yay, after church morning tea. Um, <clears throat> we used to do morning teas when we used to, before COVID, I know that's a long time ago now, but before COVID when we used to have a 9 o'clock and an 11 o'clock service, we used to have morning tea uh, at about 10.30 between the two services and we're going to go back to having morning tea. However, to have morning tea, we need some church people to volunteer to bring the milk, to bring the food, and to set it all up and serve it. Uh, now, I did send out an email. I know not all of you read the emails, but I did send out an email back, I think it was Monday or Tuesday, saying we're going to try and launch morning tea from Sunday the 3rd of October. Um, and... If you're available, please ring Janine McGackis, who coordinates our morning tea program. And I asked Janine on Friday, Janine, how many people have rung you? And she said, no one. She said she'd been sitting by her phone expectantly all last week, waiting for the calls. But they didn't come. Now, church, if we want morning tea, and I've had so many of you say, we want morning tea. If we want morning tea, we do need to step up and out of a heart of grace and love and service to our church family, we need to step up and say, I'll volunteer uh, or our family will volunteer only once a month. We're going to have four teams, you only have to do it once in a month. So if you want morning tea, next Sunday we need 
two or three families to volunteer before next Sunday. Call Janine McGackis. Uh, her phone number is in the new church directory, and if you regularly attend our church, today you got your new church directory. Yay. Thank you for everyone who's provided all their details and their photographs and so on. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, don't leave it behind. Please take it home. And if you've got last year's or the previous year's or the previous year, previous, previous year of the church directory, then please bring them back. Uh, we... Use, reuse the plastic covers, the spiral combs, and we shred the contents so that that doesn't get kind of left around uh, for people to get that information. Um, I also have to say thank you to those who came and helped at Market Day yesterday. Uh, there is quite a bit of produce and there is also quite a number of cheesecakes available that weren't sold yesterday. So you could have morning tea today if you like cheesecake. Uh, they're four, $4, I think that was what you said, $4 each uh, for cheesecake today. Not a whole cheesecake, they're cheesecake slices. Um, so after the service today, there's produce, there's craft things uh, all up in the hall. Um, please uh, go up and have a look and maybe buy some of those things. Let me read the Word of God, and we're reading today from Luke chapter 18. Um, words are up on the screen, but if you've got your Bible or your device, please follow the Scriptures in that. So, this is uh, a parable that Jesus told um, in Luke chapter 18, beginning at verse 9. He also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. And this is the parable. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified, rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Our God, we thank you that your word is truth and that your spirit who inspired it still speaks the truth of the word of God into our lives today. We want to hear from you in this very straightforward, simple parable. Speak, we pray, our God, in Jesus' awesome name. Amen. Well, here is the most fundamental question facing all human beings. If there is a God, and in reality the overwhelming majority of human beings think that there is some sort of divine, Yes, they have different concepts of what the divine is, but overwhelmingly, more people in the world believe in the supernatural, in the divine. If there is, then how do we connect to that divine? And there's only two basic answers to that question. 
either we make ourselves acceptable to the divine through human effort, human achievement, human accomplishment, performing rituals and ceremonies and being good as best as we can. Or we rely on what God does for us. They are the only two basic answers to the question. How do we as human beings connect to the divine? Either we rely on our efforts or we rely on what God has done for us. Now, by Jesus' time, the Jewish religious leaders were teaching the Jewish people that God was real. Hey, they're right. God is real. The answer to that is yes, there really is God. They were teaching that God has revealed himself. And they were right. God has chosen to reveal himself. Human beings can have some understanding of what God is like by looking at the, at the stuff that God has created. But for us as human beings to truly come to know God, we need God to reveal himself. And yes, God has done that. <coughs> Excuse me. They were teaching that God had entered into covenant with their ancestors. And they were right. God had done that. And they were saying that, therefore, we as the Jewish people are special to God. And they were partly right about that. For they took that specialness a step too far to say that God was only interested in them and no one else. And they were saying that rightness with God was attained through keeping the law and doing the good works that God required of you, and they were wrong. For that's not the answer. And they were saying, God's king was coming to restore glory to the Jewish nation. And they were partly right and mostly wrong in how they understood that to unfold. And so in that context, Jesus tells this parable. To, and it tells us in the verse 9, he tells this parable to some people who trusted in themselves and who viewed others with contempt. This is a very straightforward parable. It's not complicated. It's about two individuals, both seeking to attain rightness with God. Both of the individuals were Jewish. Both are in the Jewish temple, probably at the time of the morning or the evening sacrifice, 9am or 3pm. Both are praying to the one true God. But there are two very different outcomes. One man's spirituality is unfounded. Despite his devotion and despite his fervency, his spirituality is not founded on reality. While the other man's response to God results in his justification before God. So, let me make the statement. We're to be people of true spirituality. We are to be those who are truly in right relationship with God. Firstly, in focusing on God, not on self. Now, both of these men in Jesus' story addressed their prayers 
to God. They understood rightly that there is a God, that God is approachable and that God responds to the prayers from human beings. But the Pharisee was not actually focused on God, he was focused on himself. In fact, Jesus says, and this is a telling statement, that he was praying this to himself. You pick that up as we read the passage? Jesus says the Pharisee was praying this to himself. Even though he addressed his prayer to God, in actual fact, he wasn't focused on God, he was focused on himself. And he was praying it to himself. And he says this, I'm not like other people. God, I thank you that I am not like other people. This is, a, this is focused on himself. I'm not a swindler. Now, swindlers, the word simply means robber or a thief, someone who acts in a financially inappropriate, immoral way. I'm not unjust. Word just simply means a cheater, someone who's dishonest, those who act in ethically immoral ways. I'm not an adulterer, those who act in sexually immoral ways. And then, noticing the perfect example of the type of person that he was not, the Pharisee says, or even like this tax collector. This is all about him. Yes, he began his prayer by saying God, but it's not focused on God, it's all about himself. About seeing himself as more spiritual, as superior, as better than others. You know, I think there's a warning in that. A warning in that for us. Now, we're not Pharisees. We're not Jewish religious leaders, at least not. I don't know any of you here who are, let alone being Jewish, but being Pharisee. Cool. So that there's a warning here. When God transforms our lives, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit of God indwells us and begins His transforming work in our lives, <coughs> excuse me, we can fall into the trap of looking at ourselves and saying, well, I'm not like those other people. We can fall into the same trap. Now, I don't want any of you to be swindlers or unjust or adulterers. I don't want to encourage any of you to behave in those sorts of ways. We shouldn't behave in those ways. We should have our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and we should be running the race that is set before us, the race of faith, so that we might be like Christ who dwells in us. Yes, thank you, amen. That is what we are meant to be like. But just because we're not like all those others, we must be very careful not to favourably compare ourselves with all the others, like this Pharisee did. When we do that, the focus is on ourself, not on God. Secondly, we need to focus on repentance, not ritual. The Pharisee then continues to tell God how much he complies with the rules and the rituals. He highlights two things. He said, I fast 
twice a week. Now, the Old Testament law prescribed fasting only on one particular occasion for the Jewish people. They were to fast in preparation for the Day of Atonement. And the requirement for that is set out in Leviticus 16. Yes, there were other fasts that they may have chosen to to embrace from time to time, but the only prescribed one was the Day of Atonement. But the religious Pharisees had added a twice-weekly fasting routine on Monday and Thursday. Now, they didn't call the days Monday and Thursday, which the days we call them would have called them Monday and Thursday. That's our names for those days. But on those two days of the week, Pharisaical Jewish people fasted Monday, Thursday. Aren't you glad you're not a Pharisee? Because Monday's coming real soon. That's it. Close the fridge and the pantry door tomorrow morning. <clears throat> and then the, this Pharisee the, highlighted the other thing. I pay tithes on all that I get. Now, the Old Testament prescribed tithing. But religious Pharisees took that to the extreme. Even tithing their garden herbs. So when they picked some mint, parsley, or whatever the herbs were from the garden, they tithed a tenth of what they picked. They put aside to give into the Jewish religious system. Now, that was simply a pharisaical rule. It was nothing in God's word about that. But just to make absolutely certain that they tithed everything, they even picked their herbs and divided them up in that way. <clears throat> now, it's not wrong as a spiritual discipline to fast. It's a good thing to do. It's not wrong as a spiritual discipline to tithe. That's a good thing to do. In responding to God's love and God's provision for you. But not as a ritual to appease God. <coughs> Excuse me. In contrast, the other man was standing some distance away, Jesus said. He was unwilling to even lift his eyes up to heaven. He was beating his breast in, a, in anguish. The tax collector was acutely aware of his unworthiness to be in God's presence, of his own sinfulness and of his sorrow and anguish at his spiritual condition. He was saying, God, be merciful to me. Now that word merciful means appease, to make propitiation, to make satisfaction. It is only used in the Bible, in the New Testament, twice. Here, in this parable that Jesus tells. And in Hebrews 2.17 where it refers to Jesus Christ making propitiation for the sins of his people. Now, I know that's a big word, propitiation. It's a big theological word. But basically, it means to pay the price to make someone right before God. The tax collector is calling on God to provide an atonement for him. And that atonement will come through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. This is repentance. To recognise your unworthiness before God. To recognise your spiritual condition. 
and to throw yourself on God's mercy, asking Him to provide your atonement. Repentance, not ritual. Thirdly, focusing on humility, not self-righteousness. Jesus says the tax collector went to his house justified, without any works, merit, law-keeping, penance, moral accomplishment. This man is in a state of having been permanently justified. In humility, he had called on God for his salvation, and God had delivered his salvation. The Pharisee, on the other hand, is relying on the acceptability of his rule keeping and his religious rituals. He's trying to work his way to being right with God. As long as he does enough and keeps on doing enough throughout his life, his own righteous efforts, he thinks, result in God's approval. But Jesus says, he goes home to his house without being justified. Because atonement, being made at one, that's simply the, under, the sense of atonement. We are made at one with a holy God is not through righteous efforts, but through humble dependence on God's provision in His mercy. So what's Jesus saying in this parable? It's very straightforward parable, very direct, very simple. It's not in any way complicated. It's simply realise that you cannot ever do enough to make yourself right with God. You need Him to make you right. You cannot ever, no matter how good you may begin with and how far ahead of others you may think you are, you can never do enough. To make yourself right with God. Realise that it doesn't matter how far from God you may begin. He can make you right in an instant. Jesus says of this tax collector, one of the most dis despised group of people in, in Israel at the, in that time. They worked for the Roman authorities collecting taxes. They often defrauded the people from whom they collected taxes. They often misappropriated those funds and took them for themselves. This man begins so far back, but when he comes to God and says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Jesus says this man, in that instant leaves the temple and returns to his house justified, made right, at one with God. He began so far back, but just like that. Realise. That if you've been justified by Christ, it's not because you were more religious or more likeable to God and what he did for you, he can also do for the most despicable person you know. You know, that person in your work environment, that person in your neighbourhood, that person even in your family who is just so unlikable, so far away from relationship with God. Recognise that what God has done for you, He can do that for that person. No one is so far from God that 
God can't do that. Because he's a very big God, isn't he? And although your sins may be as scarlet, he can wash you white as snow. I think someone wrote a song with something like those lines in, didn't they? God is able to do that. So don't be a person who despises others. Don't be a person who looks with contempt on those who are not yet in relationship with God because God is able in an instant to transform those people's lives if they choose to yield in faith to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus is saying to us in this parable. Let me pray. Our God, we acknowledge that you have done an astonishing thing for us. We were those who were far from you. Yes, it's true, God, that when we compared ourselves with others, some of us were better than others. Some of us were, in a sense, closer to what it means to live in a way that is pleasing to God. Some of us were much further away. But the truth of it is that none of us were able to do enough for long enough to make us good enough to be right enough with you. Every single one of us had to rely on what you chose to do for us. We thank you that at the cross of Calvary, Jesus, as he breathed his last, said, it is finished. Salvation became available. The opportunity for us as human beings, no matter how good we are or how bad we are, the opportunity for us to be made at one, to experience atonement, at one meant with God, was opened for us. Jesus paid the price that we ourselves could not pay. And we, God, thank you for what you have done. Lord, we have not deserved this, but in your mercy, you have given this grace to us. And so, God, our prayer would be that we would be people who approach you with the thankful hearts that don't compare ourselves with others, don't look on others with contempt, but recognise that you desire to do this in the life of every man and every woman. Yes, we know that there are many who will continue to refuse to allow you to do it, but God, our prayer would be that you would use our life's example and our words to speak into the lives of those people around us that they might see Jesus and see that he can be merciful to them, sinners in the sight of God, but loved by God still. Our God, thank you. In your name, our Lord Jesus. Amen. But we, we're a colony of heaven on earth as we cling tightly to our life giver, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our humble bodies and transfigure us into the identical likeness of his glorified body. And using his matchless power, 
he continually subdues everything to himself. And our prayer today is that he would spring, spread his wings of mercy over us and that he would subdue us to himself where then he can have his way in us and transform us even now for the kingdom of heaven. Shall we stand and pray? Pray this prayer, this song, this prayer of holy overshadowing. Oh, spread your wings of mercy over me. And God, my heart, in true humility. No shadow of the darkness pressing in. Only the holy overshadowing. Underneath your wings, overshadowing. You are ready. Under the shadow of Shaddai, you are hidden in the strength of God Most High. He's the hope that holds us and the stronghold that shelters us, the only God for us and our great confidence. So Romans tells us, celebrate with those who celebrate and weep with those who grieve. Live happily together in a spirit of harmony and be as mindful of another's worth as you are of your own. Don't live with a lofty mindset, thinking you're too important to serve others, but be willing to do menial tasks and identify with those who are humble-minded. Don't be smug or even think for a moment that you know it all. Never hold a grudge 
or try to get even, but plan your life around the noblest way to benefit others. I pray that you will go out today and be something brand new. I want to go out today and be something brand new, and I want to live the noblest way to benefit others. God bless you. Amen. Oh, don't forget now, there's cheesecake for sale, there's produce, and there's some bags and masks. If you'd like to get anything like that this morning to take home for something sweet, God bless.